All right. Uh, Mr. Powell, do you want to state your full name and spell your last name for the record? James Ernest Powell, P-O-W-E-L-L. Mr. Powell, uh, did you hear me go through the penalties for perjury before? I did. And do you understand what perjury is? I do. Being advised of the potential penalties for perjury, do you promise to tell the truth in this case today? I do. All right, thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Bender. Thank you. Um, Jimmy, could you uh, tell us by whom you're employed? Summit Carbon Solutions. In what capacity? Chief Operating Officer. And can you briefly describe for us your role with respect to this project that's before the commission today? I'm accountable for the design, construction, uh, and transition operation, ultimately the operation of the Midwest Carbon Express project. And uh, in terms of the overview of the project, you provided a very detailed um, overview in the previous two hearings, is that correct? Particularly in Bismarck. Correct. And then you provided a more summary overview uh, at the Gwinner hearing, is that correct? Correct. For the public that's here today, can you just once again, just very briefly overview the project for us? Sure. So conceptually, the project will gather or capture CO2 emissions from the fermentation process of industrial processes. And at this point, industrial facilities, at this point, it's 32 ethanol plants. We'll take the CO2, we'll compress it into a liquid or excuse me, dense phase or supercritical state. We'll inject it into a pipeline network that consists of approximately 2,060 miles, uh, as was said earlier, from ranging in diameter from four inch to 24 inch. And then we'll inject that on the northwest side of, of Bismarck in North Dakota for permanent storage and sequestration. Now let's uh, talk a little bit more specifically about Cass and Richland counties. Um, can you briefly describe um, for the uh, commission staff uh, how many miles of pipeline will be in Cass County? In Cass County, approximately 22. And how many miles will be in Richland County? Approximately 65. Okay. And discuss for us just briefly the size of the pipeline in those two counties. So as the, as the pipeline leaves uh, the northern part of the main line in South Dakota. It's a 12-inch lateral moving northeast. Uh, when it gets into Richland, then there's a branch connection. It goes north, and that's an eight-inch segment of pipe that that um, eventually terminates at the Therrelson ethanol, ethanol plant in Castleton. And then there's a continuation of a four-inch that, that goes into Minnesota and connects to another facility. And let's talk about uh, pump stations. Are, in the, are there any pump stations planned for Cass or Richland County? There is a pump station planned for Richland County. You know where that pump station is going to be located if this project is approved? Yes. Here. I've got the coordinate, but essentially it's it's south central part of the state where the where the pipeline branch connections are physically located. So where it branches north and continues east and there's a diameter change, the pump station would be located at that intersection. And uh, it's uh, located on one of the maps that were filed as part of the application. Is that correct? That's correct. Do you know how far that pump station is from the uh, nearest um, occupied residence? It's, if I remember correctly, it's about 4,700 feet. It's significant dis distance. Okay. And there's going to be some noise associated with the pump station. Is that correct? Yes. And has uh, Summit prepared a noise study? We have. Is that something that someone is willing to submit to the commission? Yes. Is that something you can provide to them in the next few weeks? Yes. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, drain tile. There's still a little bit left to talk about, I think. Um, Let's talk about the, the warranty that uh, was discussed by Mr. Ellingson. Um, is it your understanding that Summit is providing a warranty to landowners uh, with respect to drain, drain time? Yes. And where is that warranty provided? The warranty is provided in the easement document that is executed with the landowner. And uh, more precisely, uh, the easement document, uh, when there's drain tile involved, will have an addendum to the easement document. Is that your understanding? Yes. Okay. And that's where the language is having to do with drain tile. Is that your understanding? Yes. 
tell us a little bit about that warranty. How did it how did it come about, and uh, um, why is it in there in your view? Well, it's atypical in my experience, and we went through my experience in, in the previous two hearings. But I've installed a lot of pipeline in this country, and typically the warranty is for a short period of time. Um, in our case, our parent company is an agriculture company, and they farm ground in several states, primarily Iowa. And so very familiar with the dependence on drain tiling and or the interdependence on drain tiling crop yield. And so the CEO of Summit Ag insisted that we provide a lifetime warranty for drain tile and terrace repair. So there is then a contract if a landowner enters into an easement uh, for the installation of line, uh, there is a contractual uh, warranty for the drain tile. Is that, your, is that correct? Yes. Now there was some discussion through Mr. Ellingson about Mr. Ellingson providing some information um, to Summit that was going to go into some sort of handout that was going to go to uh, the landowners. Are you familiar with that testimony? Yes. You were in the room and you heard that testimony? Yes. Is it your understanding that the information that uh, Mr. Ellingson provided to Summit that he discussed in his testimony was uh, included in a document that I believe is referred to as uh, Drain Tile Frequently Asked Questions? Yes. Just give us a moment. I'm going to show you what uh, we'd like to have marked as uh, Exhibit 6. Even we're going to talk 5, excuse me, thank you, Your Honor. Show you what's been, what we'd like to have marked as Exhibit 5. Is, uh, is that the document that uh, includes the uh, information that uh, Mr. Ellingson suggested be included in a uh, document to be distributed to uh, landowners? It is. And uh, tell me how this uh, document is distributed to landowners. So this document, when the information package is um, provided to a landowner, there are several of these types of communications or fact sheets that are typically included. And when uh, your land agents go out and speak with uh, landowners, do they typically uh, have this sort of document with them and, and distribute it to landowners as well? If they're if they know that there are drain there's drain tile on the landowner's property, yes. And uh, can you tell us where on this uh, document, uh, Exhibit Six, there is a discussion with respect to warranty? It's at the, it's on the the back side of the page near the bottom. Okay. And can you uh, read that provision for me, please? Yes. Uh, the question is, is there a warranty on the work? Summit will hold themselves indefinitely responsible for any repairs or rework necessary that is determined to be directly related to pipeline construction activities. We will handle, we being Summit, will handle all design, inspection, scheduling, and documentation on warranty work. The warranty of the drain tile will be captured in the addendum of the easement agreement for all landowners of the pipeline. So in addition to the uh, Witten excuse me, written notice that the warranty is going to be granted, that, as you indicated earlier, and is what's indicated here as well, it will ultimately be included in the addendum to the easement. Is that correct? It is. That's all the questions I have for this witness and offer exhibit five. Any objection, Mr. Pellon? Mr. Jordy? No objections. All right, uh, Exhibit 5 is admitted. Mr. Pelham, any questions for Mr. Powell? Yeah, I do have some questions uh, for you, Mr. Powell. Uh, you were here for the testimony of Mr. Ellingson, correct? Yes. Any inaccuracies that uh, you heard Mr. Ellingson in his testimony today? It's a lengthy testimony, so I didn't hear anything that, that concerned me as being a, a, an, an inaccuracy because they were specific as to uh, some of the commitments uh, 
that as to warranty work, as to uh, workmanship, uh, do you expect Ellingson's to perform in the manner that was testified to by Sir Ellingson today? I do. And we, we heard a lot about the warranty and the, the length of the warranty, and I believe it's answered on Exhibit 5 and indefinitely, indefinitely responsible is another way, in your opinion, sir, to say indefinitely responsible? Is it a lifetime? Yeah, it, it runs, and, and Mr. Pelham, it, in the easement document, it's worded, I think, more specifically. But it runs with the life of the, of the easement document. Is there a form uh, addendum to the easement uh, pertaining to the warranty that can be provided to the commission? Yes. And the Mr. Mr. Pelham, that, that's something that I can put together and be happy to provide you with it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, past, uh, past hearings, we've heard a little bit of an update on the right-of-way uh, progress. Uh, do you have uh, any updates as far as the uh, right-of-way acquisition progress since the last hearing? I know it's only been about two weeks, but... Uh, I do. Uh, we've put together the same table that you've seen previously. So I'm assuming we can provide that update county by county. But generally, Mr. Pelham, uh, we acquired almost five miles in, in the last two weeks since uh, the hearing at Gwinter, which is approximately one and a half percent of the total pipeline length in North Dakota. Mr. Pelham, because it was somewhat insignificant, we, we weren't planning on presenting it. But once again, if you'd like it, we'd be happy. Fair enough. Uh, if you have it, we may as well have it introduced, I think, and I think it would be Exhibit 6 if we introduce that. As, as far as uh, condition of use permits for Richland County, are you able to testify, sir, as to what uh, would be needed for condition of use permits in Richland County? I do I do know, Mr. Pelham, that we need about 88 permits totally, total in, in Richland. I don't have committed to memory how much of those are conditional use. Fair enough. Do you know whether or not townships in Richland County uh, have zoning authority? I do not off the top of my head. I do have that information, but I know some some areas do and some areas do not. Fair enough. And specific as to Cass County, uh, do you know whether or not a condition use permit has been applied for uh, in Cass County by Summit? In Cass County, we have about 26 permits to obtain, and we've applied for about half of those, about 13. Again, I can't. I can get you the information, but off the top of my head, I can't tell you which permits have been applied for and which ones have not. Fair enough. So it's fair to say that uh, this time you're you're not able to provide any information as far as the condition of use permit applications for uh, Richland County, Cass County, correct? Correct. It was a letter uh, we talked about uh, the last couple of hearings from the state geologists. And, uh, and I understand that the last winter uh, hearing, it was going to be a meeting that day or the next day or around there. Did that meeting take place with uh, the state geologists and, and the company? It did. Are you able to provide uh, any additional information to the commission as far as the results of that meeting with the state geologists? I have a summary of the output from the meeting, meeting minutes, and, and we can provide that. Mr. Pellin, excuse me for continuing to interrupt in your questioning, but I believe um, that uh, a representative of Summit may have filed that, but uh, I, I will check and make sure that uh, if there was something along those lines, you get a copy of it. What was filed, uh, and you're correct, Mr. Bender, what was filed uh, looks like it was received April 3rd, uh, and it's uh, docket number 165, filed with the commission, a letter. Uh, from you, a cover letter, and then a letter from uh, Mr. Alec Lange, Lang, Lang uh, engineering manager, um, sort of summarizing the meeting. Uh, I don't know if 
he's here and we can ask him a question specific or you're able to, have you seen this letter from Mr. Lane? I have. So as far as uh, the letter goes, it indicates that uh, there was some feedback on potential uh, nearby landslides, identified two of them as potential risk, and then a general statement that Summit looks forward to future engagement with the Geological Service survey. What future engagement with the Geological Survey in the state of North Dakota is anticipated by some? It's my understanding that state geologists said there was no follow-up required. We did review the areas that were identified, and I believe, Mr. Pelham, that there was one area that we had not reviewed that was about, was offset from the pipeline right away and had not demonstrated movement, at least the information we have for a period of years. Um, but the state geologists recommend that we take a closer look, and I believe that work is in progress. Okay. So there is an ongoing process to determine uh, potential issues with nearby landslides that uh, Summit is working with the state geologists on, correct? Again, we are working on the information they provided, and we're happy to follow up. It's my understanding they indicated that they weren't going to provide any approval about the technical work that, that we're doing. Um, and indicated that it wasn't necessary to resubmit any follow-up, but we're happy to do that if that's necessary and happy to follow up with the state geologist again. Well, if there's one area that's still being looked at, I think it would be appropriate to follow up with that, certainly with that one area. Well, they had a discussion about that area during the meeting. Okay. Well, the, the letter from Mr. Lane doesn't include any of that. So, okay. I mean, it, 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 it would be appreciated to have more specifics as to what was specifically agreed to currently with, with the geolog geological survey and, and summit on that. Understood. Uh, as far as the uh, State Historical Preservation Office, uh, what's the status of uh, concurrence or potential concurrence letter as to uh, the, the proposed project? I understand there was a meeting that was taking place at around the last hearing date. Yes, and, and we are working with the, um, the State Historical Preservation Office to provide the updated information so that they can do a final evaluation. Uh, what's the anticipated time frame for that to be completed? I don't have a specific date, Mr. Pelham, but that's weeks, not months. Paul, I don't have any other questions for you today, Mr. Shukman. Mr. Pelham, sorry, Mr. Sh the, other, the, only, the only thing I would add is we haven't completed 100% of the survey yet, so we'll get the SHPO up to date, and as we progress the survey, we'll continue to, to provide them with updated information. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> Mr. Ellingson had uh, kind of talked or started some discussion about uh, the installation of the pipeline at a specific depth to enable the uh, Rain tile to function correctly. So, is the company willing to adjust the depth of the pipeline to ensure continued operation of the existing drain tile system? Uh, we are, and in this part of North Dakota, we have. Um, I heard, I think you asked the question of a depth of six to eight feet. Um, we prefer not to go deeper than six feet because that introduces more safety risk. It'll be a larger trench, potentially impacts the, the, the width of the right of way. Um, other safety precautions that we have to take because of the depth, but six feet top of height, um, we would do, we would accommodate and have done so for landowners in this part of North Dakota. And Mr. Shook, can you pull your mic closer? Sure. Thank you. And as far as spacing, so we talked a little bit about this um, with Mr. Mr. Ellingson, um, the spacing between the CO2 line and the drain tile. What, is there a minimum spacing that you're aware of? Well, typically we ask for a 24 or require a 24 inch spacing, but for drain tile, we await that. And so, but we would like a minimum of 12. But you, it, in certain cases, if there were required, if, if there's something forced it to be closer than 12 to maintain that grade that Mr. Ellingson talked about, would you be amenable to uh, spacing less than 12 inches on the case by case basis or? We would. We just wouldn't want that corrugated metal sitting right on top of the pipeline. Sure. But yes, we would. Okay. Uh, that's all my questions. Thank you. Mr. Jordy? Yes, thank you. Uh, Exhibit 5, this is not a legal document, correct? 
Correct. This is promotional materials that you give out um, on what you claim and how you claim you will handle things in the future. Is that fair? Well, I think it's an informational document, Mr. Jordan. All right. So in, in other words, it, it, it's of no consequence legally what you say in this document, whether you're going to lifetime or indefinitely be responsible for repair work unless that language gets into a signed contract with the landowner. Well, unless it gets into the executed easement document. Correct. And and you wouldn't be surprised to learn, would you, that that language is nowhere found within your easement agreements? That is incorrect. All right. Let's, are you referring to Exhibit C, Addendum of Special Conditions, Paragraph 2, entitled Drain Tile and Terrace Repair? Yes. All right. Let me read you the first sentence. Quote, for so long as company exercises its rights under the easement agreement, and then it goes on to say what will happen. So would you agree with me that your duties ex extinguish when you no longer exercise rights under the easement agreement? You mean our obligation ends? Correct. Our obligation ends at that point, but whoever assumes that easement, if the pipeline is still in service, is bound by that same obligation. All right. And, and but this unknown company isn't here seeking approval. It's Summit Carbon Transport LLC, correct? You know, uh, Your Honor, I'm going to object insofar as it calls for a legal conclusion. Now, he can answer with respect to his experience, but uh, he's not a lawyer. Well, he didn't draft the contract. And I know he testified as to the contract and, and offered some opinions on it. But once again, he's not a lawyer. I'm not going to say he shouldn't answer, but keeping that in mind. Well, this is cross-examination based on essentially wanting to induce the commission and the public to believe that if this pamphlet has words on it, then it's good as gold. And the language we just established is not what they claim it to be in Exhibit 5. So that's my question. I think he can answer as his in his capacity and as a summit representative. I don't. I agree. I don't think he's got the legal... The, He's not a lawyer, so he doesn't have the capacity to make a legal conclusion, but he definitely can answer and should answer in his capacity as a representative of Summit. I mean, I can read the actual paragraph. That's in well, just, well, it very specifically it, says that we warranty green tile installation. Okay. Well, m maybe you're giving different easements to different people because I have one in my hand and the word warranty is, is nowhere in there. So if you've updated it, I... I personally, and I'm sure the commission would love to see that language. Uh, but what we've established, sir, is that your, as in Summit SCS Carbon Transport LLC, your responsibilities end when you sell, transfer, or assign your rights in this pipeline, correct? I'm going to object. Once again, calls for a legal conclusion. Plus, I, I think that's a mischaracterization of the uh, language in the uh, document. You ask him about transfer of the lease if it's or transfer of the. Can you clarify your question? Sure. So, so the, the whole purpose of Exhibit Five is to make everyone believe that you Summit will, for a, the lifetime of this project, guarantee and warranty the work. And my answer to you, sir, isn't it correct that as soon as Summit sells? or is no longer a part of this project, your exit strategy, then you, Summit, no longer has a lifetime responsibility to warranty that work. I'll allow him to answer as to his understanding of what happens should a sale happen. Yeah, and even though I'm participating in several of these, I'm not an attorney, obviously, I will say that it's my understanding when that easement is, is recorded at the courthouse. It's a legal document and the obligations that Summit agrees to in that easement carry on as an obligation with anyone that that, that maybe acquires the company if we choose to sell it. As long as the pipeline is in service or in operation. That's my understanding. All right. Let's con continue on uh, in that same paragraph then. It's true, sir, is it not that the company, meaning here Summit, has in its sole discretion to either, quote, confirm the claim of landowner or to say, no, we don't think there's any damage here. 
that you know? We do have discretion, and that's why we're partnering with Ellingson, who will photograph every single connection or repair that's made, document it. I heard one of the commissioners ask if that documentation would be provided to the landowner. Absolutely. If the landowner wants it, we'll maintain a record. So if there is water retention 100 yards away from the right of way, and we can determine that that was because of the construction activity, then yes, we will repair it. So the determination of whether or not the damage is because of construction activity, again, that analysis starts with Summit to determine whether or not you believe your contractor was responsible for damage. It starts with Summit and our contractors. All right. And so just hypothetically, a contractor who did the work doesn't want to be on the hook for damage they caused. They say, we didn't do that. What's the next step for the landowner? Well, our position is summit is we're entering into a long-term partnership or relationship with the landowner. So we're going to do everything we think is necessary to make sure that that landowner is treated fairly. And if our contractor disagrees and we agree that it's due to construction activity, then we'll honor our obligation. Would you agree it'd be a reasonable condition if this commission were to state that all of the connection photographs be uploaded to a database and documented so that there's never any question of missing photographs or um, the evidence being buried both literally and figuratively? Uh, hold on. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to object because I think we're getting a little bit outside the scope of the jurisdiction of the commission. The commission's role here is citing entity and is reviewing the application of the company. As far as private easements entered into between company and landowners, the commission is not involved in that process. So to the extent that we continue on, I'm going to object as to these lines of questions. This, this witness also is not a lawyer and is being asked questions on legal means uh, of certain things in, in, in the easement. So I'm just going to state that objection for the record. Thank you. I'll join in the objection. I'll respond to the objection, and the response is all of this is potentially adverse on the effects of the welfare of the citizens, which is one of the burdens and elements of proof in this case, number one. Number two, there can be no pipeline without the easements. The easements are the sum and substance of what we are talking about, whether we're saying it out loud or not, and what the contracts that they can force upon landowners unwillingly through condemnation form the basis of the project. So if we're not talking about that, we're not taking an honest assessment of what this project is and should it or should it not be approved and how people are, real people are affected. That's the, the nature of this, this line of questioning. And that, that all may be true, uh, but for purposes of viewing this application, specifics of the statute are what the commission is to be reviewing. I don't believe that there's any issue with calling some of these issues in, into question and in questioning on that. But when we're going line by line through the, through the, the, uh, the easement and questioning specifically as of the easement, the commission cannot go over line by line and do a veto as far as what is, is being done. So I think that the discussion as to the impact that, it's, that uh, this line potentially has on landowners is absolutely appropriate. But we're straying into the legalities of an easement agreement that is a private contract between private company and a private citizen of the state. Certainly the commission is, is going to be reviewing the statutory requirements and this is part of it. But when we get into the specifics of that, I think that is where the objection lies. And certainly as to the condemnation aspect, the commission has no authority. That is a judicial determination. And the commission has no authority whatsoever as to the condemnation process. Well, I, I have to respond to that. Forget the condemnation part, but the fact of the matter you is... You brought it up, sir. Okay, well, then I'll talk about it. I mean, it's interesting that the PSC, of all people, is objecting to letting the truth be known no, about no, how no, landowners no, are affected. I allow you to characterize it. Well, that's what you're doing. Not okay, a... okay, hang on. I agree with Mr. Pelham. I think we're getting too far into questions about the specifics on the lease agreement. I think generally... You're correct, Mr. Jordy. The, the statement of the issues allow for some general probing on these issues, but when we're getting into line by line on what the easements are providing, that 
that is going beyond the jurisdiction of the, the commission on those issues. So my, my question then would be, how possibly can the commission have an intelligent discussion of what conditions should be placed to ensure, quote, the welfare of the citizens of North Dakota, end quote, unless you know and unless there's testimony on how bad the landowners are being treated vis-a-vis -vis the easement contract? sure how you want me to respond to that. I, I get that the statement of the issue is pretty broad, but again, I think there's some validity to the objection that, you know, you're talking about an agreement, the landowner signing with the company, and that's outside of the, the commission doesn't have any jurisdiction over what those documents are, those agreements contain. So I, I totally understand that this is kind of, you know, area, I guess my direction to you would be to try to stay closer to what the commission has jurisdiction over and not over those private agreements. I mean, the specifics of what they're agreeing to with Summit is not, not something that I think we need to spend time on here. But generally, the concerns of the landowners and what's the warranties being offered, I think that, that you can absolutely ask questions about that. That's, that's fine. I mean, I, I can ask all the same questions. I won't use the word easement, but just know that's where they're all coming from. Um, so, sir, you, you understand that this commission has the power to put conditions, any conditions it's, it deems reasonable on this project, should they grant you approval? If you know. I believe they do. All right. Now, let's... Just shift for a second here. Who is SCS Carbon Transport LLC? Who owns that? That is a, a, a company, an entity of Summit Carbon Solutions. Okay. And who owns Summit Carbon Solutions? It's a privately held company. Who are the, the top percentage owners other than Mr. Rastetter? Objection relevance. Well, I'd like, I mean... Maybe it's not. It's only not relevant if the PSC doesn't care who they're giving these powers to. I mean, we have no idea who this company is, and I think that's relevant for the inquiry here. They're asking for significant powers over 320 miles of land in the state forever. Right, and I think what Mr. Jordy's attempting to do is he's going to keep walking down that line until he tries to get uh, Mr. Powell to respond to who owns this company, what individual owns this company, how much uh, percentage of that company does he own? How much investment is? I mean, we're just going to head down this path. We'll be here for hours. <laughs> well, the, the fact they've complicated their ownership structure is not my problem. Okay? If, if that's how they want to play the LLC games, we can do that. But I think the public deserves to know who the heck we're even talking about. Who is this company? You know, no, no, you know, mischaracterization complicated their ownership structure. Who says it's complicated? He says it's complicated. Well, it wouldn't take five hours to explain if it wasn't complicated. Okay, okay. I'll allow you to ask some general questions about mm -hmm. ownership, but again, I don't. I'm not sure that that's time well spent to spend a lot of time on on corporate structure. All right. Well, <laughs> is it true that a South Korean company owns 10 percent of Summit Carbon Solutions? SK is a global company that is an investor, I, I can't speak to the percentage of ownership. All right. And what are the actual assets of some SCS Carbon Transport LLC? Does it own anything? Objection, relevance. What are the assets backing it if there's a problem in this state forever? I'll allow them to answer. If you know. I don't fully understand the question. Can you repeat it, Mr. Well, well, sure. I can start an LLC tomorrow and file an application, copy this, and be just the same as you. So what are the assets of SCS Carbon Transport LLC? Does it own anything? Is this the deal company? What is it? Well, it's a private company, but if we're permitted by the PSC in North Dakota and we install the pipeline, that will be an asset. So it's your statement here that this entity would actually take title to the pipeline itself, the actual pipe, the above, above ground appurtenances and equipment? The, 
there are two objections. One, once again, relevance. But second of all, this is the third opportunity the interveners have had an opportunity to cross-examine this witness. He was examined, cross-examined for the better part of three hours in uh, Bismarck. Mr. Jordy made a decision not to attend that hearing. But there were a lot of questions asked. He, he could have asked these questions there. Now here we, here we are in the third hearing, and uh, you know we're putting uh, Mr. Powell on the witness stand to briefly summarize for the audience uh, what this hearing is about, and he's using it as an opportunity to conduct an entirely new area of cross-examination, and I'm going to object. Well, yeah, I'm going to cross-examine him on the application, and it's, this is all relevant to and it. And you had that opportunity in Bismarck, and you had that opportunity in Gwinter, and you That's passed right. it up. Amen, and there's no requirement I had to be there, sir. Um, I understand the objection. I, it's noted for the record. I, I'm going to allow, I, let me ask you this, Mr. Jordy, just for, for my own, <laughs> cause you know, we've talked about this. We do have time scheduled to keep today. Do, do you have an idea of the scope of questioning you're going to ask today? Like time wise? No, no. I mean, I'm, I'm going to ask if this, I mean, again, this is a gigantic, never done before project, and I'm going to keep going until I'm either, you know, cut off or finished. So that's the plan. With Mr. Powell, is that? Yes. So, okay. And I guess if there's less objections, it'll go quite a bit faster. Well, that answer's not terribly helpful for me. <laughs> I, say. I agree. I agree. I mean, but no, I, I'm sorry if, if, if we were supposed to come with, you know, being on the clock or with something, I, I didn't prepare that. I've got the application here. I've got my notes and I'm marching through it. Well, and to address your objection, Mr. Bender, it's my understanding that while we're discussing the same project, that each of these hearings was to be independent. So I think he does, Mr. Jordy does have some leeway to ask about the application um, and I, you know, I think when the hearings were structured, it maybe wasn't anticipated that we were going to have one intervener representing multiple landowners throughout the pipeline project. So, um, and I just, I think we're going to have more of this at other hearings. So I am going to allow them because we have the time today to address some of these issues. So. Um, but again, you know, I think for purposes of the commission, I'm not sure that corporate structure is going to be number one thing that's relevant for, for them and what they're going to be considering and deciding. So I guess my direction, Mr. Jordy, would be to try to focus on those issues that are most pertinent for the commission in making citing decisions. Well, but totally respect that. I mean, the applicant is SCS Carbon Transport LLC, and, and no one sitting here other than Mr. Bender can tell us who that is. And that's who you're being asked to approve. I mean, I can start Brian Jordy LLC tomorrow and be in front of you, have no assets go bankrupt like Denbury did in Satarsha. So I'm just trying to figure out from this gentleman, what, I mean, what is this company that's being asked to have this project approved? That's it. I mean, what's the big secret? Who is it? That's a question to you, sir. Finally, thank you. I'm, Judge, I'm not, I'm not the commercial representative for Sun of Carbon, and, and I'm not, um, I don't have the level of detail necessary to dig into not only the corporate structure, but all the other commercial aspects of this project. And I do, just for the record, want to clarify, Mr. Joy, he said, this project is, I can't remember your exact phrase, but one never done before. You're all familiar with the code of access, the you know, energy transfer bill, 2015 timeframe. And it was a very large project, similar scale, larger by North Dakota. All right, what does that have to do with supercritical carbon dioxide? Well, they're both governed by the same terms of regulation. Okay. I'm sure you know that. I very aware of that. I'm not sure the relevance, but okay. So I didn't get an answer to my question. Who is SCS Carbon Transport LLC? Are you claiming you as chief operating officer doesn't can't answer that question? That's correct. All right. And your your COO also of Summit Carbon Solutions LLC, which you said was uh, what one of the owners? Is that right? Summit Carbon Solutions 
is the is the overarching company all right and does summit carbon removal llc of which you're also the chief operating officer have any ownership of scs carbon transport your honor can i just have a standing objection i i want this to go as quickly as possible but i do want to put objections in the record so on a standing objection yep to relevance yep your objection is noted thank you again i'm not i'm not responsible for the commercial structure of the, of the company and when was scs carbon transport created how long has it been in existence if you know i do not and is it true that scs carbon transport llc applicant here doesn't own operate or manage a single inch of carbon dioxide pipeline anywhere in the world that's correct no sir um apparently you have exactly one contract with one ethanol plant in the confines of north dakota is that correct your honor i think we're starting into an area now where we start about talking about common carrier and going to object i made that objection at the uh, bismarck hearing and i think ultimately uh, as to relevance that uh, objection was granted we're heading down the same path again uh, i'm reading right out of their application so they put all this in play how is this not relevant how is this possibly not it's not relevant as to whether this uh, entity is a common carrier or not. You have that issue right now before a district court matter in North Dakota, in South Dakota, and possibly other states. It's not for this entity to be making decisions with respect to common carrier, and that's the direction you're heading with your question. Well, I, I guess I would just put something out there for the record. Is it possible for this company to even apply for the powers they want to be granted if they are not a common carrier absolutely all right i just want to make sure that's your position okay um so again my question was is it true you have a single contract with the Tharleson ethanol plant castleton same objection your honor he can answer that question but i agree we did go over this in bismarck where this this particular commission does not have any jurisdiction over the common carrier determination um, you're not going to hear the word common carrier come out of my mouth your honor and we went through that in Bismarck as well, but Mr. Baki didn't use the word common carrier, but was asking the same questions. Well, this has nothing to do with common carrier. It has to do with the fact they want 320 miles of people's land for the benefit of one ethanol plant. That's what this project is about, and I'd like to talk well, about Well, okay, that. so he can answer that question. All right. And that's a mischaracterization of the application as well. We don't need all of the pipeline in North Dakota just to connect the Tharleson plant. Uh, do you want to be sworn in? I'm trying to ask this gentleman these questions. So, Mr. Well, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that you ask questions that are supported by the facts and, and that you, you aren't. I'm, okay, let me just continue to read out of your own application. Uh, sir, it's true that the only contract you have is with the Farleston ethanol plants, as stated on page one of your application, correct? In North Dakota. As I sit here today, that is the only plant contracted in North Dakota. All right, so why should North Dakota be the dumping ground for the CO2 trash of Iowa, Nebraska, Minnesota, and South Dakota? Objection, argumentative. We don't need that kind of talk about, uh, you know, what the product is and calling it trash and garbage. Very inappropriate, Your Honor. I agree. Can you rephrase your question, please? Sure. Is CO2 as it comes out of an ethanol plant a waste product, yes or no? CO2 is a commodity in an emission stream. Okay, and you believe that when you put CO2 into the ground forever, it's still a commodity sitting there doing nothing? I'm not going to speak to whether it's sitting there doing nothing, but as you are well aware, CO2 can be used for other purposes. Well, sure, but you're not doing that. Your application does it not specifically state that the plan here that you'd like to be to approve is to permanently sequester the, all the volume of CO2 that you intend to transport through your proposed hazardous pipeline, correct? As contracted today, that's correct. All right. So are you are you leaving wiggle room that there's something that is not spelled out in this application that we should be getting ready for in the future that you're going to unwind? your statements in your application that this is for permanent sequestration only? No, as I said, as contracted today, there could be other industrial facilities that want to connect to this pipeline system, want to move CO2 to another terminus. It does not exist today. So that option's available. But today, the volume we have contracted 
you are correct, is intended to be in sequestered, stored and sequestered subsurface on the northwest side of Bismarck, North Dakota. And you would agree that when your stated purpose of this pipeline is uh, allegedly to assist uh, ethanol plants reduce their carbon intensity score, correct? I don't know what you mean by allegedly. It absolutely reduces their carbon intensity score. Okay. And allegedly there, sir, was a qualifier as to that's what you claim the quote purpose and need in section 2.21 page found on page 10 is, correct? to assist ethanol plants in reducing their carbon index score. Yeah, it does. It doesn't allegedly do it. It does it. Okay. Let's, I'll, I'll stipulate to that. You would agree that within the confines of North Dakota here sitting in front of the North Dakota Public Service Commission, that it is not in the welfare of North Dakotans to approve your project of 320 miles when you are only connected to a single ethanol plant in North Dakota, correct? Well, I would disagree because I think the growers that sell their, their corn to the Therosin ethanol plant for a premium that would not be there if it were not for the ethanol plant. And those workers that are employed directly by Therosin or indirectly by Therosin, it's, it's a meaningful project. All right. And, and before Summit Carbon Transport LLC existed, those growers were selling their corn to that ethanol plant, correct? Correct. All right. And so, again, you're asking for some approval over 320 miles across ground that many North Dakotans don't want to give you to locate a hazardous pipeline of which you've never constructed, operated, or maintained before, all for the benefit of a single ethanol plant in North Dakota, correct? There are many mischaracterations there. Do you want me to start from the beginning? Go ahead. Ask your question one more time, please. All right. I, I don't... Personally, for my questions, and maybe others disagree, and that's obviously fine. I don't care about Iowa. I don't care about Nebraska, South Dakota. We're talking about North Dakota. And, sir, it's true that within North Dakota, you're asking for approval to trench and dig and locate a hazardous pipeline over approximately 320 miles of land, correct? Correct. You previously stated that most people don't want, and I'm sure you're aware we signed easements with 70% of the for 70% of the mileage in the state. So I think it's a mischaracterization to say most people don't want. Do you think there's any such thing as a quote voluntary easement when the power of eminent domain is over the head of a landowner? Jack calls for a legal conclusion, possibly, but you can answer it with respect to your own knowledge. Absolutely. Okay. And at the Gwinner hearing, remember the uh, that elderly uh, lady who had signed a, a waiver but still showed up to the Gwinner hearing to um, voice her concerns? Do you, do you recall that? Do you believe that was a voluntary agreement or that she felt she had no choice but to give in to you? I feel it was a voluntary agreement. Okay. All right, so uh, we've established that, again, there's only one ethanol plant in, in North Dakota, and so you're asking this commission to give you the right to build 320 miles of hazardous pipeline to service one ethanol plant and then pull in CO2 from other states, correct? Objection asked and answered. Oh, I didn't, I, it was asked but not answered. He can answer. As we sit here today, as I said, we have a contract with one ethanol plant in North Dakota. Okay. And supercritical CO2, that is not the same as liquefied carbon dioxide, correct? Supercritical CO2 is a dense phase CO2. All right. Which is not the same as liquefied carbon dioxide, correct? Define liquefied carbon dioxide. Well, are you familiar with that term? I am. Okay, so then you tell me. Well, are you familiar with the term? Define it. Well, unfortunately, sir, I get asked the questions. Well, I'm just going to tell you, if you're, you're probably familiar with the phase envelope of CO2. And, and dense phase or critical phase CO2 does have some liquid characteristics. Okay, so when, when you make in, in application and statements that, you know, CO2, we, we have it in our soda pop and things like that, to be clear... Supercritical CO2 under 
2,500 PSI, 2,100 PSI is not the same thing as a CO2 as we experience in our soda pop, correct? I never made a comment about having anything in soda pop. All right. Maybe that was your lawyers in South Dakota, and that maybe it was. Um, but would you, would lawyers said that either, but. Okay. <laughs> well, I, we don't have to get into that. The question is, would you agree that when there's, quote, many uses to CO2, and my goodness, it's in soda pop, for goodness sakes, that's not what you're transporting, correct? I did not say that. And we're transporting dense phase supercritical CO2 at, that is under pressure. And the reason why uh, your pipeline is different than a crude pipeline is because you, to maintain the supercritical um, nature of the CO2, you have to maintain both a minimum and a maximum pressure threshold, correct? To maintain that. So your analogy to a crude, crude pipeline is somewhat accurate, but it's similar to a refined products pipeline. But a crude oil pipe, gas liquid pipeline. I'm sorry, go ahead. Or a natural gas liquid pipeline, which is also um, fall under the same federal regulation. But you referenced DAPL, and would you agree, sir, that if DAPL, if, if the pump sh shut down and the product was just sitting in the pipeline, that that would not be an imminent risk if the, prep ad, if the crude oil is not moving in the pipeline? I don't understand the, the question. Well, the question is, it's true, is it not, that the volatile nature of supercritical CO2 is that you have to maintain both an upper and a lower threshold of pressure. That's just to maintain that state. If the pressure drops below that minimum threshold, then it just changes the phase, the state of the phase. There's no imminent danger. Well, at that point, isn't it true that it's more likely that the pipe will corrode? No. And why do you, what do you base that on? Well, the only the, the risk of corrosion, at least internal corrosion, is if it has water in the product stream, and we're dehydrating the CO2 as it leaves the capture facility. And and actually, the, the CO2 that you're transporting is actually CO2 that you own, correct? Objection. In heading down the path of uh, the issue of common carry. I'm instructing not to answer the question. Can you repeat what your question was? Yes. Is it true or is it not that you, you meaning Summit, owns the carbon dioxide that you plan to transport from the Farleston plant? Same no objection. What's the relevance of whether or not they own it? Well, I think it's important to know who is owning the, the product that is the volatile product that then could be potentially catastrophically dangerous. I mean, I guess what's the big mystery of who owns it? I don't see why that's a tricky question. I mean, I'm just saying it's not relevant for this hearing because this this uh, commission does not make a determination as to who is a common carrier. You have that issue before the district court in North Dakota and in South Dakota. There's no reason to present that here. It's not relevant. Who's talking about common carrier? I just asked him a simple question. You're doing the same thing, Mr. Jordy. The only thing you're not doing is mentioning common carrier, but that's the way, that's the reason you're heading down that path. Oh, well, thank you for telling me where I'm going, I guess. I appreciate it. Is it, I mean, is that why you're asking that? Because of common carrier status? No, I could care less about that. I'm curious who's owning the carbon dioxide that is going to be filling up the, the holes in, in western North Dakota. I mean, who owns the, the stuff? Your Honor, for him to suggest he could care less is just a total misrepresentation of his position in this matter. They tried to conduct discovery in the North Dakota matter that's before the district court on common carrier. The judge said no. So he's trying to conduct his discovery in this hearing so he can get what he could not get in the proceeding before the district court. I'm going to object and I'm going to instruct the uh, witness not to answer. Oh, then I'm going to move for fees and costs for the whole, this entire hearing. So, okay, there we go. I mean, hey. I mean what's the mystery? What's, why don't you want him to answer that question? What's the problem? I responded to your question. All right, all right. So, anyway, I guess I'm sorry, Your Honor, is there a ruling on that, or I guess we'll get our motion for fees and costs in? Um... Mr. Pelham, do you have a position on behalf of the PSC? I, I, 
I mean, well, I, I, I'm not privy to the knowledge as, as far as what's going on between parties in a district court action. The question is simply who owns the CO2? Uh, I mean, everything else aside, I think that would be an appropriate question. Appropriate or inappropriate? Uh, appropriate question. I, I don't have any objection to, to that question. I've not noted any objection to that question. But I understand what Mr. Bender is saying. I don't have anything to do with that, however. Uh, for purposes of today, though, only, in this venue, who owns the CO2, seems to be a fairly innocuous question. Yeah, and I'm in the same position. I don't know what's going on in the district court actions. I don't know what's going on with discovery there, so it's hard for me to say that that's an improper means to the question, but I'll allow him to answer. I'm instructed to not Okay, well then I am moving for costs of this entire proceeding tax to summit based on Mr. Bender completely contravening the judge's order uh, and direction. I think that's a serious offense and we are requesting 100% of our costs to be here today for that purpose if you want to stand on that objection. Yeah. All right. Um, are, are, are you willing to answer that question or is it such a secret that you don't want to tell us. Action. I mean, these argumentative statements. I, I explained why I don't want them to answer the question. It's not a secret. It's just it's inappropriate for this hearing. It's not relevant. Okay, let's let's move on. If you're going to make that motion, you're going to have to file it in writing. I mean, I've never addressed that on behalf of this commission before. So uh, I, I've never had a lawyer, just, you know, back like to a judge like that either. So I guess we're all in this boat, but. Um, let's move on to page two. Installed at a minimum of 48 inches. Uh, you understand that, that you, sir, as applicant, could install this at six foot, seven foot, eight foot if you wanted to, correct? Well, I'm sure you, you know, Mr. Jordy, that the federal regulation is the <coughs> but we consider construction risk Construct, constructability and other issues when we're determining the depth of a pipeline. Are you aware of the phrase level of cultivation? I, I'm not an agricultural expert. I've heard the phrase. Do you have any knowledge that corn roots can grow to as deep as six foot in some types of soil in some areas? Again, I, I'm not an agricultural expert. Our parent company farms thousands of acres in corn and I've never heard them use that term and they don't have concern. They individually don't have a concern for the depth of pipeline and quite frankly the landowners that we sign easements with across the footprint have never mentioned that either. So what is the relevance to the fact that the owners of this project who are going to make billions of dollars don't have a concern with how deep the pipeline is? What, what's the relevance of that statement? I didn't say they didn't have a concern. Okay. Um, so let's just assume hypothetically that corn, for instance, can grow to, to six foot. And <clears throat> that being the level of cultivation, you would agree that it would be prudent for you to um, locate any such pipe hazardous pipeline at a minimum depth of six feet. I would tell you what I do know is that there are thousands of miles of pipeline in this state, and I've installed some of that pipe and in other states, especially other agricultural states like Minnesota, like Nebraska, like South Dakota, like Iowa. And most of those pipelines are installed at depths of, of three foot. And that has an effect the corn suitability rating or the yield on those properties to my knowledge. Okay, would, would you be surprised if someone testified, um, a landowner with pipelines that has direct yield loss years and years after the pipeline was put in at a depth of three or four feet? I may not be surprised by anything, Mr. Jordy, but I can tell you this as well, that Summit will keep landowners whole of any yield efficiencies associated with the construction of this pipeline. Up until the date when, when you sell the pipeline. Again, 
So, so speaking of that, do you have an individual, um, and I might mispronounce his last name, but Eric Shohanovic or Shonovec, a gentleman by that name that works for Summit? Mr. Powell? I, there's an Eric Skuvenik. Skuvenik. That's, that's what I'm thinking of. And what's his role? He is the senior director of pipeline and facilities. Would, he, would you be surprised if he told um, one of my clients that as soon as you get this approved and in the ground, that the exit strategy is to sell your interest, sell this company? I would be surprised because I don't believe he would say that. But secondly, he doesn't know that because that's not the strategy. The strategy is to build and operate this pipeline system. Isn't it true in your private placement memorandum that the exit strategy is a sale within five to six years after construction is completed? I don't remember that. All right. Now, you've got a map in your application, and, and I want to make sure so that if this commission was to approve this project, is, is the map in the application that's found on about page three, I'll just... Is this what you're asking approval of in terms of, of the route or, you know, if, if you get the stamp of approval, what, what is the geography, sir, that is that you believe is being approved, the corridor? Can you just describe what you believe that is? Well, we've submitted in the application a corridor with on either side of the center line of the pipeline, and that's what we're asking approval for. And, and so is, is that the 150 foot on either side of the center line? Does that make up, or was it 300 foot? What was the corridor, please? The corridor, I believe, is 300 feet total. Yes. All right. So, so if the pipeline was dead center and the corridor you seek, we'd have approximately 150 on, feet on either side. If it were dead center. But as you probably know, there are a lot of features uh, in routing a pipeline generally, but especially in this state, a lot of cultural and heritage features that are very restrictive. And so uh, we try to make sure that that pipeline can be sited in that 300 feet, but directly in the center lot, in the center of that 300 feet, we have to have discretion. And if there had to be a reroute outside of the corridor, this 300 foot envelope, you would agree you'd have to reapply for approval of that reroute? Objection as far as it calls for a legal conclusion. If we had an answer, if, you, if you know in your capacity. Thank you. Well, we do have, and we've talked about it with the commissioners in the previous two hearings, we did have three instances where the route could potentially exceed that mile and a half threshold. Um, and so those, we're under, we understand the requirements of that and we'll follow those requirements. Okay, and I, I apologize, but I didn't quite under, understand that. It, you're asking for approval, sir, of a 300 foot corridor, correct? Correct. And now you're, you're talking about a mile, help me on the mile. My point is, Mr. Jordy, if, if, we, if we have a need to move outside of that corridor, there are rules within the PSC that we have to follow to make sure that we can get that approved. Okay. Um, given the Burley County ordinance uh, resolution that's, that's in place, uh, stating that the project needs to be moved several miles. Will, will you um, be filing a new application for that reroute? Agreed. And also the Burley County issues, if we could save that for the Burley County hearing. I mean, I think well, okay. the issues about routing around Bismarck and those Bismarck specific issues, we should save it for that venue. For that hearing rather than this one okay and and if that was confusing i apologize i'm not talking about like you know the development issues i'm talking about the county commission passing regulations requiring the that no carbon dioxide pipelines can be within i think it's eight miles of, of a, the geographical area around around bismarck and i'm simply asking based on that that's getting outside of 300 foot corridor. Therefore, are they going to reapply for that route, that new route? I think you, 
I think you can ask them if they're going to reapply, but I don't, you can't ask them a legal conclusion about whether or not they have to reapply because he's not an attorney, so I don't think that would be proper. That, that, that's fair. I'll, I'll rephrase it. I appreciate that. Are you planning to reapply based on the actions of the Burley County Commission? No. Does that mean that you are not planning to heed and follow the Burley County regulation? Objection calls for a legal conclusion. Uh, probably gets into attorney client privilege communications. Uh, a whole host of objections. Well, I, I agree. <laughs> well, one, one of the factors is have they worked with the counties, the opinion of the counties, um, rules and regulations, and permits that are required by the counties. We have an example where a county has made a rule and regulation, and I'm just simply trying to find if they're going to follow it or not. When I think he answered that, I mean, I would prefer if your question was probing how they are working with local government agencies. And again, I prefer we stay away from the Burley County issues because I don't think this is the hearing where we want to be addressing that. All right, so I guess we'll just leave this with the understanding that it's true, sir, you're aware that Burley County entered an ordinance for the, the new regulation zoning wise that according to it, whether you agree or not, would prevent CO2 pipelines with certain within certain proximity of Bismarck, correct? I'm aware that they passed an ordinance, correct. All right. And and then the, the follow-up answer that you provided, I believe, was that even though that would be outside, that would require a movement or rerouting outside of the 300 foot and even outside of a mile and a half, you are not planning to file a new application. Okay. So that's correct. All right. Now, your application here says 18 million metric tons per annum of CO2. Your application in South Dakota, yeah. Iowa is 12 million. Is there any reason for the discrepancy? I was thinking the same thing. Before. The, the permit applications will be amended. 18 million tons is the total yeah. capacity of the pipeline yeah. system. It's kind of, that was my, my thought. Okay, at full capacity every year, 18 every million year metric tons, be, right? Full capacity. Okay. And I'm sorry, you said you'll be amending uh, Iowa and South Dakota yeah. to be consistent uh, with the 18 you know, million. They may or may not have been amended. I would have to check. Right. But the, the, the yeah. system will be designed, well, and it, if we receive like a permit from those two states, you know, we will reflect the 18 like million. Say, well, you know, like what and did have you secured the, all of the like core space the or whatever your phraseology work? is, the, the secure go, sequestration and, and sites and to go. accommodate? Uh, 18 oh, okay, million fine. metric tons per annum. Yes. Yes. All right. Or and we say, how many years oh, do you believe hey, have you secured for space if 18 million and 18, 18 million, etc.? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so he can complain about I don't, the frustration. But we require a significant amount of more space that will store 18 million tons. Right. Well, we did, we, you did say reach out to you if you had any questions. Do you have, and again, if you, this isn't yeah, I mean, you know, part of your area, I'm not trying to um, be difficult on it, but is there someone at Summit or is there a contractor that would have that data to, to give an idea of for how many years um, the, pro, the, the CO2 on this pipeline could move and be accommodated in the storage space you have? Direction relevance. Well, how long are you approving this project for? It'd be nice to know, I mean, what's what's the capacity? Is this a two-year project, a 20-year project? I, I'd like to know. Objection is noted. I'll allow him to answer if he knows, but I get the impression he might not know. Well, we do have expertise, and, and it depends on how many injection wells you permit. That's within in the NDIC jurisdiction. Those permit applications are in progress, so I think it's premature. We do have poor space that you can conjecture can store X amount of CO2, but at this point, we haven't made a determination how many applications we're going to file for each injection well at each site. So I think it's premature to speculate. 
Okay, but, but would that information, I mean, certainly you would have geologists or folks on staff or contract that would be able to run that analysis. Is that fair? Yes. All right. Now, um, on page 10, um, section 2.21, purpose and, and need. So the purpose and need for your project contains a little over half a page. Is there any other portion of your application that specifically deals with the purpose and need for your proposed project? Yeah, I didn't reread the application before today, so I, I can't remember if it does or does not. All right. And is it fair, sir, that your pitch to this commission as why this is quote unquote needed is so that the ethanol plants in other states that don't pay taxes in to North Dakota can have a, a pipeline to transport their carbon dioxide? That's not my pitch. All right. Um, <clears throat> so what if you had to summarize in your own words the, the need, not your desire, but the need, the actual need for this project within South or North Dakota only, what would that be? Well, as we've stated in previous hearings, you know, there's a global movement to decarbonize. There's a United States movement to decarbonize. And so for the ethanol plants, they have concerns about their longevity. One, one option for them to ensure that they can, stay, they can sustain their business for years to come is to reduce their carbon intensity score so that they're on the front end of that decarbonization effort. And by doing that, that opens up markets in the low carbon fuel markets, opportunities for them in the low carbon fuel markets, which then maintains their longevity and then by extension creates a market and a demand for corn growers in North Dakota. That only, that only keeps the prices of corn elevated. I think it also maintains the land values for those growers. And then, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it, it maintains a, a livelihood for direct employees and indirect employees of that ethanol facility. So do you agree then that the balance here for whether or not there are any adverse effects upon the welfare of the citizens of North Dakota is foiled or balanced against the, the profits of the single ethanol plant in North Dakota. Would you repeat that, please? Yes, you would, based on the need that you just stated, which was to, is to lower carbon index scores of ethanol plants, and we've already established there's only one, the commission's role then is to determine, is it more important to not subject 320 miles of North Dakota land to this project, or is it more important that the wealthiest man in North Dakota continues to profit at his ethanol plant? I don't understand the question, other than I will add that it's not only Therrelson. I mean, as we construct this pipeline, it goes into operation, then we'll have significant tax burden that obviously we understand and are, are fully intend to comply with, and that just doesn't benefit the growers that support the ethanol, the Therrelson ethanol plant, or the employees of the ethanol plant, those taxes go to the state of North Dakota. All right. And, and again, so we're talking about taxes that the Therrelson ethanol plant is already paying, workers that's already paying, and, and that is the big need as opposed to whether it be one or 100 or 200 landowners that don't want this. How, how do you think the PSC should pick as between a single ethanol plant or uh, the landowners who have you, you have heard that oppose this project? Again, I may have been unclear in my response, Mr. Jordy. Summit will pay those taxes. Those are in addition to any taxes that Therrelson will have to pay. And again, as I also stated previously, we've reached agreement with 70% of the, of the landowners or the mileage in North Dakota. So I think that's the majority. Do we still have an aspiration to reach agreement with the remainder of the landowners? Absolutely. All right, so if 30% remains, there's approximately 96 miles of landowners that you at least haven't been able to convince that this is a good thing for them. And so we're weighing those 96 miles of hundreds of landowners, again, versus the benefits to the Tharleson ethanol plant, correct? That's your conclusion, Mr. Jordan. All right. Well, that's, do you have anything to add? Because all you've told me is about the Tharleson ethanol plants, their employees, and then the taxes you're going to pay. Well, I think it's a mischaracter 
characterization to say we haven't been able to convince. We have ongoing conversations with landowners every day, especially those landowners that are represented by attorneys that allow us to have conversations with either the attorneys themselves or the landowners. Okay. I, I, I feel like that was a dig towards me, and maybe it was. Maybe it wasn't. Um, I'm right here. We can talk about anything you want. Um, so... Uh, again, do you think it's the job of the 96 miles of, of North Dakotans who don't want this or haven't signed up to take one for the team for the ethanol plants in South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota? I believe I've answered your question, Mr. Jordy. All right. I think you have to. All right. Now, the significant tax revenue, is it true that personal property in the term of the pipeline is depreciated on a seven-year schedule? I'm not a tax professional. All right. Well, as a chief operating officer, do you keep track? Hang on. Hang on. Oh, I didn't hear it. Sorry. Objection relevance. It, can you address relevance? Yeah. He just said the need for the project is they're going to pay taxes, and so now we're going to get into the taxes. So you don't pay real property tax, sir, on land that you don't own, Correct. We have taxes associated with ownership of the asset. All right. I want to divide up real property and personal property. So a landowner pays real property tax. Bill comes from the county assessor. And you, your company, would only pay real property tax on land that it permanently acquires for, for instance, the, the valves or something like that, correct? If you know. Again, I'm not a tax professional. All right. Well, who... At your company, other than the chief operating officer, can tell us about the taxes that you just claimed were the big benefit for this project. I said a benefit, and we have a vice president of tax. All right. So do you know or would you agree that a pipeline is depreciated as personal property, much like a combine or other things, but a pipeline schedule is seven years? Again, I'm not a tax professional. All right. So for the taxes that you're claiming you're going to pay, you're not qualified to really talk about that, correct? I just said I'm not a tax professional. We did have Ernst & Young, under the guidance of our tax professional, prepare an economic impact study or analysis. And those taxes um, were determined by Ernst & Young. It, it, is that the same Ernst & Young that um, was um, found that its, its CPAs were cheating on the entrance exam? And you hear those stories. Is that the same interest that Aaron, Ernst & Young are relying on? Yeah, I, mean, I, I agree. Okay. Well, I'm just, you know, the validity of the statement, I guess. But okay. Um, and Mr. Jordy, it's about... 20 after 12, if you've got a good spot to break, if we could break I, for lunch. Whenever your honor wants. Well, when you're... No, I'm, I mean, I can break now. I mean, it's, okay. it really doesn't matter. All right. Why don't we do that? Um, we'll take our lunch break and try to reconvene around 1 o'clock.